That's a lot of names. Am, am I right? You guys are like, wow, we're going to really talk about all that this morning. Yes, we are. Um, first of all, though, it's good to be back with you. Um, I was in Chattanooga, Tennessee last weekend and had the privilege there of preaching at Resurrected Reformed Baptist Church, which is a historically African-American congregation. And man, that was a joy. Uh, wonderful church that loves the Lord, loves the scriptures, loves to worship. They say amen a lot more than you all, which is really fun for a preacher. Uh, can I get an amen? Yeah. So I bring you greetings from our brothers and sisters there, and as well from Sojourn Church, uh, a church that you have helped to support over the past three years. So it was a joy to be in Chattanooga last weekend, but really glad to be back here this morning. Uh, before my trip to Chattanooga, of course, we had a national election, and I'm sure that some of you are happy with the results and others of you are unhappy with the results. So I want to remind you this morning of the good news that Jesus Christ was not on the ballot. Yeah, see, that, that line definitely would have got an amen last week, so you guys are right on that. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't require your vote to stay in office, and so that's good news for all of us. Um, but I want to, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Let's go. Let's go. But I want to think actually more deeply for a minute about what an election is. If you think about it, an election really is a debate about what's wrong with the world, isn't it? And that's the same question the book of Genesis is concerned with. What's wrong with the world? And how can it be made right? Perhaps you noticed in the lead up to the election that both sides were telling you this could be the last election ever. This is your last hope to save democracy. So on November 4th, the day before the election, you might have seen Elon Musk was on the Joe Rogan podcast and he said, if Trump doesn't win, I think this is the last election. Literally the same day, at a Kamala Harris rally, Oprah Winfrey said, if we don't show up tomorrow, it is entirely possible that we will not have the opportunity to ever cast a ballot again. Now, this is not the first election when people have said things like this. And so one clever journalist posted the morning of the election, happy third consecutive last election ever. <laughs> so you made it through at least the third consecutive last election ever. Congratulations. But you'll notice what an election does is it gathers up all of our anxiety about what's wrong with the world and it focuses it in a certain direction. It tries to get us to act based on our concern about the fact that things aren't as they should be. An election is an argument about what's wrong with the world, or at least what's wrong with our country. And what's interesting is all of us believe that something is wrong with the world. We just don't all agree on exactly what that is. So the book of Genesis is telling you a story that you know to be true. The story that something has gone wrong with the world, the world is not as it should be, and the world needs to be restored, repaired, redeemed. Now, Genesis is a long book. It is 50 chapters long, and we've been looking at it one chapter at a time, and sometimes we can lose sight of the big picture, the big story. So let me just remind you of what Genesis has told us about the world so far. First of all, Genesis told us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, that you and I are created beings, that we have a creator, and that he made the world very good. Second, Genesis has told us that we are made in the image of God, and therefore that every human being has dignity and value and worth because we reflect God and we are made to represent God in the world. Genesis told us that human beings have turned from God. We have seen things we desire, we have decided that we will define for ourselves what is good, and we have taken what does not belong to us. See, good, take, as Pastor Aaron reminded us a few weeks ago. And in so doing, we have plunged the world into ruin. Genesis has also told us that that's actually not the worst part of the story, that once the fall happened, things got worse. Human corruption only increases. And so Cain murdered Abel, sin increased on the earth, the thoughts of the human heart were only evil continually, and so eventually God judged the world in the flood, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And yet, as we saw last week, even righteous Noah can't save this ruined world. 
Noah recapitulates the sin of Adam and Eve. He has his own fall in his own garden. And so it's clear that he will not be the one who brings salvation to the world. And so by the time we get to Genesis 10, the question remains, how will the world be saved? How can the world be saved? So this morning we consider chapters 10 and 11, and the text here breaks into three sections. In chapter 10, you have what's called the table of nations, all those names of peoples. In chapter 11, the beginning, you have the story of the Tower of Babel. And the end of chapter 11, we have the genealogy of Shem. The text of Genesis this morning shows us the world that needs to be saved. It shows us humanity's plan for saving the world. And it shows us God's plan for saving the world. The world that needs to be saved, humanity's plan for saving it, and God's plan for saving it. So let's look, first of all, at the world that needs to be saved. I want you to look with me at the first and last verses of Genesis 10. Genesis 10, verse 1, these are the generations of, now Aaron has mentioned to us in the past, that's a little section marker, it marks there's a new section here, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood, and then it ends with, these are the clans of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies in their nations, and from these the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Now, in between these two bookend verses are listed 70 different peoples. Here's why that's significant. The number 70 is 7 times 10. These are numbers that signify completeness or wholeness. Here's how one Hebrew scholar puts it. Making the offspring of Noah's sons total 70 is a literary device to convey the notion of the totality of the human race. The same device is employed in rabbinic literature where the phrases 70 peoples or 70 languages express humanity in its entirety. This affirms the common origin and absolute unity of humankind after the flood. The human race is one race with one common ancestry. That's what Genesis 10 is telling you. And that's a very important thing for Genesis to be telling you. And here's why. Because many of the instances of racism throughout history have arisen because people have said, we don't all share one common ancestry. So this is actually a very important theological point. Now, I want to remind you, Genesis is a book of history. It is theological history, but it's telling us history. And so I want to survey for you some of the peoples that are listed here in Genesis 10, because here's what's funny. We read this text and, you know, you don't hear New York City or Chicago or, you know, the people of Alabama. They're not mentioned here. And so you hear all these weird names and you're like, I, I am not even sure what we're reading right now. But what's fascinating is as you begin to study who this is talking about, what you discover is it's actually talking about all the people groups that actually remain to this day. First of all, in Genesis 10, verse 2, we have listed the sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras. Here's who some of these people are. Gomer and Magog are the nomadic Black Sea tribes that settled in what is today Ukraine and Russia and Eastern Europe. Madai is another name for the Medes. This is a whole empire that existed in northern Iran and Central Asia. Javan is the Ionians, that's the Greek people. Tyrus is another name for the Etruscans who settled Italy. So if you have European or Slavic or Asian or Greek ancestry, these are your people. In verse 6, we read about the sons of Ham. Cush, that's Ethiopia and Sudan. Egypt, Put, which is Libya, and Canaan, which is Palestine and Jordan. And so the spread of these peoples is south into Africa and north around the coast of the Mediterranean. So if you have African or Mediterranean ancestry, these are your people. Verse 22 lists for us the sons of Shem. It lists Elam, which is an empire from southern Iran and India. Aram, which is Lebanon and Syria. It lists in verse 26, all the sons of Joktan, which all were tribes that settled on the Arabian Peninsula. And so if you have Persian or Arab or Indian ancestry, these are your people. From these nations, from these, the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood, verse 32 tells us. These are real peoples and real groups that began to settle and migrate across the earth. And many of them are our 
ancestors. Let me remind you what we know about human history from sources outside the Bible, all right? The cradle of civilization, as you perhaps know, is widely reputed to be ancient Mesopotamia. This is where we have found the oldest records of human civilization. Mesopotamia, meso means between, and potamus is the Greek word for river. So Mesopotamia means the land between the rivers. That's what it's called. What are the rivers we're talking about? Well, it's the Tigris and the Euphrates, the two rivers that are mentioned back in Genesis chapter 2. These rivers flow through what is now eastern Iraq and western Iran to what we know as the Persian Gulf. The oldest civilization we have thus far discovered is the Sumerian civilization. The Sumerians settled in Mesopotamia around 5000 B.C. Their capital city was Uruk or Erek. It's mentioned right here in Genesis 10, and you can see it marked on the map in red. It's in modern-day Iraq. It is, to this day, an active archaeological site where artifacts are still being discovered from the Sumerian Empire. The Sumerians gave us modern agriculture. They invented irrigation. They gave us modern time. They invented the 60-minute hour. And they gave us written language. The first written language we know of is ancient Sumerian. Now, the place where the Sumerians lived is known as the Plain of Shinar. In fact, Shinar is probably just a Hebrew way of saying Sumer. The Sumerians were conquered by the Akkadian Empire in about 2300 BC, who were then subjugated by the Babylonians around 2000 BC. And all of these ancient empires, the Sumerian, the Akkadian, the Babylonians, all built their cities in the plain of Shinar. The cities listed in Genesis 10, cities like Erech and Akkad and Nineveh and Ur, these are all actual ancient cities on the plain of Shinar. You can go visit them today if you want. There are active archaeological digs at every one of them. And if you go home and Google them, you can read for the rest of the day. There is a ton of information on these cities listed here. The center of empire in the ancient Near East was the plain of Shinar. So Genesis is telling you, from here, the people spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Now here's what's fascinating about that. Anthropologists will tell you there are five civilizations in the world that, that seem to us to be very, very ancient. There are five civilizations outside of Mesopotamia that we know are very old. Egypt which settled about 3,500 B.C. The Indus Valley civilizations in India, about 3,300 B.C. The Andes Mountains civilizations in Peru, around 3,200 B.C. Ancient China, which dates to about 3,000 B.C. And the Olmecs in Mexico, which date to about 2,000 B.C. What you will notice is that every one of those civilizations is newer than ancient Mesopotamia. In other words, the idea that the people spread abroad on the earth from Mesopotamia after the flood fits the evidence we have from archaeology and from history. Now, for many modern people, the idea that all of us descended from the same ancestors is hard to embrace. You think about the differences in ethnicity and language and culture, which are vast. You think about the new advances in genetic science, and you wonder, could we all really have descended from Adam and Eve, from Noah? Is that realistic? Well, I want to read to you from a research study done at MIT and published in the scientific journal Nature in the year 2004. The title of the paper is, On the Common Ancestors of All Living Humans. This is not a theological paper. These are not Bible scholars. This is a scientist at MIT, publishing in the journal Nature. Here is what the study says. Everyone on earth may share a common ancestor who is remarkably recent. This study introduces a large-scale, detailed computer model of recent human history, which suggests that the common ancestor of everyone alive today very likely lived between 2,000 and 5,000 years ago. And everyone alive today shares the same set of ancestors between 5,000 and 15,000 years ago. 
The finding that everyone on earth today shares such recent common ancestors may be for many a remarkable and inspiring one. Indeed, we are all related. This study took into account the patterns of migration that we know uh, to every part of the earth. It took into account historical events like volcanoes and plagues. And taking all of that into account, everyone alive on earth today shares the same set of ancestors between 5,000 and 15,000 years ago. Which again, is exactly what archaeology suggests. And it's the same story as what Genesis 10 is telling us. That's good news. The Bible is history, friends. Genesis 10 is introducing us to the world that needs to be saved. It's reminding us that every tribe and every tongue and every nation on pe- and people group on earth shares a common origin. We are one humanity. And that one human race is the race that God is out to save and redeem. God's purposes for the world include all of these peoples, all of their descendants, everyone on the face of the earth. But God is not the only one who has a plan for saving the world. So let's look now at humanity's plan for saving the world, which is recorded for us in the story of the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11, verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words, And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Okay, so notice the location, the plain of Shinar, the home of Babylon and Nineveh and Ur and Akkadia, the center of empire in the ancient Near East. Verse 4, they say, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. This is where you should hear the ominous music playing in the background. Because who else in Genesis built a city and named it after themselves? Cain did. This is not a good good development in the story. The point of this building project is to get up to the heavens. To achieve transcendence. To be like God. Which hasn't gone well so far in Genesis. Let us build a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. We need an identity. We need some way to define ourselves, some way to be remembered on earth. Let's build a city so that we can make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And remember, dispersing over the face of the whole earth is exactly the commission that God had given in the first place. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That was God's design. So this city is built in rebellion against God's command. And that's why Babel or Babylon becomes a repeated biblical theme for human pride and human rebellion and human empire. Anytime for the rest of the Bible that the prophets speak of Babylon, it's not good. Babylon is the representative representative city of human pride. It's, it's sort of the archetypal sin city. That's what you should hear of when you think Babel or Babylon. See, humanity has a plan for saving the world. It's a plan that relies on human pride and human power. The Tower of Babel is human beings saying, we don't need God. Our achievement and our ingenuity And our strategy and our technology will save us and save the world. And since 4000 BC, the only thing that's really changed is what our self-salvation projects look like. We're still building the Tower of Babel. We just do it a little differently than they did. David Zoll has written a very interesting book titled Seculosity. You can see what he's doing in the title is trying to argue that secularity is just a different kind of religiosity. Here's what he writes in that book. The polls tell us that confidence in the religious narratives we've inherited has collapsed. What they fail to report is that the marketplace in replacement religion is booming. We may be sleeping in on Sunday mornings in greater numbers, but we've never been more pious. The promise of salvation 
has fastened on to more everyday pursuits like work, exercise, and romance. And it's making us anxious, lonely, and unhappy. What he's observing is that there is a religious impulse in human beings. There is something in us that longs for transcendence and salvation. And that impulse can't be shut off. We're just going to direct it in different places in our lives. And the Tower of Babel is a picture of what that impulse leads to. It's a picture of man-made religion. They had brick and bitumen. We have nuclear power and artificial intelligence. They built a tower. We build skyscrapers and data centers and jet aircraft. But the impulse is the same. We will save the world. We will save ourselves through our pride and our power and our ingenuity and our creativity and our strategy. And so I just want to ask you a simple question this morning. How much of your life buys into that narrative? What tower are you inclined to build? What city are you contributing to? In what ways are you seeking to make a name for yourself? How much of your religion is about you working harder and doing more so that you can reach the heavens and establish a stable identity for yourself? That's a frustrating and exhausting way to live. But that's humanity's plan for saving the world. Human pride, human power, human ingenuity. We'll figure this out. We've got this. The story takes a turn in verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. That's the punchline. You're supposed to laugh right now. <laughs> and here's why. Because the stated desire of the Tower of Babel is let's build a tower with its top in the heavens. Like, let's get up to where God is. And the writer's telling you, God couldn't really see it from where he was. <laughs> he had to come down to kind of look at it. It was so far below him, he had to work a little bit to go take a look at the city and the tower that they were building. There's irony here in the text. Verse 6, and the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they all have one language and this is only the beginning of what they will do and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they may not understand one another's speech. God is not threatened by their ingenuity. His words here are in the same spirit as Genesis 6, where it tells us that he saw that the thoughts of man's heart were only evil continually. God recognizes this impulse toward empire and self-exaltation is not going to lead in positive directions for humanity. And so in his gracious judgment, he confuses their speech and disperses them across the earth, and it says they left off building the tower. Have you noticed that every empire that rises eventually falls? Human beings continue to believe that we can build heaven on earth, that human pride and ingenuity can build the city the world needs and can unify the human race. This is the promise of every empire that has ever existed from Babylon to Rome to the United States of America. But it's never been done. And it can't be done. There's a reason that in the book of Revelation, the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. It's a deliberate inversion of the Babel story. The human impulse is, let's build ourselves a city that reaches to heaven. But God invites us to welcome a city that comes down from heaven to earth as a gracious gift that we did not build and cannot build. And that brings us to the final movement of the Genesis text, God's plan for saving the world. 
right after this wonderful story of the Tower of Babel. Genesis 11, verse 10, we read, These are the generations of Shem. And then you have another list of names, another genealogy. Shem, Arpachshad, Sheila, Eber, Peleg, Reu, Sarag, Nahor, Terah, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Ten generations ending with three sons, just like we saw in Genesis 5. And one of those three sons is Abram. And as we turn the page into Genesis chapter 12, God is going to make a promise to Abram that through his offspring, all these nations that have dispersed across the face of the earth will be blessed. In other words, the promise that God made to Eve back in Genesis 3, the promise that one of her descendants would crush the head of the serpent, that promise is going to be carried forward in a descendant of Abraham. So what is God's plan for saving the world? Well, in a word, it's promise. At this point in the story, God is going to set aside all the nations of the earth, and he's going to make a promise to one man. And so for the rest of the Old Testament, you're not going to hear very much about Gomer and Magog and Meshach and Ashkenaz. The promise focuses in on one family, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their descendants, the people of Israel. But that story moves forward with Genesis 10 in the background. As the apostles will tell us in the New Testament, God allowed the nations to go their own way for a season. And eventually, as the focus narrows to Abram and Isaac and Jacob and their descendants, and as we trace the story that God is writing there throughout the, bi the biblical storyline, that story is eventually going to bring us to the city of Bethlehem to a manger and a stable, to Mary, the daughter of Eve, and Joseph, the son of Adam. It's going to bring us to a humble birth attended by angels and visited by shepherds. That story is going to bring us to Galilee and Nazareth, the backwaters of the nation of Israel, where suddenly a Jewish rabbi would come on the scene teaching and healing and proclaiming the kingdom of God. That story is going to bring us to the city of Jerusalem where that Galilean rabbi, Jesus, is going to begin to come in conflict with the Jewish religious leaders and with the Roman Empire. That story is going to lead us to a hill called Golgotha where the Romans are going to crucify him and hang him on a cross between two thieves seeking to put an end to his teaching and to his life. It's going to bring us to an empty tomb on Easter morning when suddenly all his followers are going to start telling the world that God has raised this Jesus from the dead and that a new kingdom has now come and is now coming. And ultimately, that story is going to bring us to the day of Pentecost when as the book of Acts tells the story, suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from, catch this, every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. What is the day of Pentecost? It's a reversal of Babel. It's Babel turned upside down. God's plan is not for the whole world to have the same language. God's plan is for the gospel to be proclaimed in every language. Through the promise God made to Abraham, God has brought salvation to the world in Jesus Christ. And now, in and through his church, he invites everyone, everywhere, in all the earth, to come to Jesus to be born again, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, 
and to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's God's plan for saving the world. What's going to save the world? Not the pride of man, but the promise of God. And friends, that's the good news that can fill your life and my life with hope. Listen, we live in a world downstream from Babel. We live in a world full of the impulse that built Babel in the first place. We live in a world that's full of projects and pride and power and human strategy. The world tells you, hey, you need to do something big. You need to live an impressive life. You got to make a name for yourself. You need to build something that lasts. It's the big things. It's the impressive things. It's the important things that are going to change the world. But actually, what Genesis 11 is reminding us is that actually it's God's promise that changes the world. And what that means for you and me is that the little things matter. In fact, it's the little things that matter most. Listen, most of us aren't going to live very impressive lives. No disrespect to you. This is a room full of amazing, capable people. But I just want you to embrace the fact that we are very normal. We live mostly normal lives doing mostly normal things in a mostly normal city in middle America. And here's what your life is going to consist of. You're going to give yourself to some things for a while, and then you're going to die. And a hundred years from now, few people are going to remember that you ever existed. Let's close in prayer. (laughs) But listen, that's actually good news because what it means is it's not the big and impressive things that matter most. Do you know what's still going to be true in 100 years? The promise of God to save every person in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's still going to be true 100 years from now and 1,000 years from now. When no one remembers you, that promise is still going to be true. And that's what gives our lives meaning. I want you to think with me about all the people who lived and died between Abraham and Jesus. Some of them you know about because you read about their lives on the pages of scripture. They're mostly like kings and prophets and judges. But most of the people who lived from Abraham to Jesus were just a small link in the unbroken chain of faithful people who took God at his word and believed his promise. And that's your calling as well, to take God at his word and to believe his promise. It's the promise of God that changes the world. And what that means is the little things you do every day by faith, whether it's changing a diaper, teaching catechism class, helping someone recover from addiction, hosting a gospel community, praying for someone in need, loving your neighbor as yourself, building your life on the scriptures, cultivating a life of prayer. The little things you do every day because of your faith in the promise, that's how the world actually changes. That's the real story that changes the world. Listen, the world around you is all about empire, strength, power, prestige, do something impressive, build something big. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. It's not the big things that matter. It's the little things. Because what changes the world, what ultimately is going to save and redeem the world, is not the pride of human beings, but the promise of God. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the glory 
of your promise to Abraham. We thank you for the reminder that wherever we come from on the earth, whatever our ancestry and our people and our background is, we are invited into your eternal kingdom in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the promise you made to Abraham and fulfilled in Jesus. And thank you that that's the same promise you are fulfilling today in our lives and through us. So would you deliver us today from the idolatry of power and prestige and position? Would you tear down the little babbles that we are building in our lives and in our world? And would you bring forth out of us this morning a simple, faithful trust in you and in your promise? Thank you that you are redeeming the world in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you that we can get in on that through simple faith. So help us this morning believe your promises anew and bank our lives on them. We pray for our good and for your glory. Amen.